Hi, everybody, and welcome to the first August edition of Book Buzz, where your BB librarians gather to talk about what we've been reading so you can find your next great read. My name is Karen Stern. I'm here with Jeff Klapes and Bridget Black and Beth Radcliffe, um, all of us from the reference desk today. Um, I'm going to start today with um, a book called Disappearing Earth. Um, I just have to get up here. Um, I'm so glad you're talking about this. I love this book. Yeah, I know you said you'd read it, so I'm, I'll be ha I'll be interested to hear what you think about it. Um, this one is this one's for all of you who are out there looking for like a great character-driven story that takes you to places and introduces you to people that you probably don't know too much about. It really, and I don't mean sort of like outer space places. I'm talking about right here on Earth. Um, in fact, it's all set, so it's called Disappearing Earth by Julia Phillips. It's her first novel, and a lot of people have been really talking about it. It's all set um, on the Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia. So if you don't know your geography of Russia, that's the very eastern, um, it's a peninsula that's right off the eastern coast of Russia, or is the eastern coast, I suppose, in a certain way. Um, it's very removed, really, from the rest of Russia. And I think from after reading the book, I get the feeling it is quite separate from the culture in, in a lot of ways too. Um, the book covers a year. Each chapter takes place in a different month starting in August. And in the August chapter, two young girls go missing and they're taken by um, a man in his car. I'm not, that's not a spoiler. Um, and each chapter ap after that is really a short story, a linked short story about people, women particularly, who are directly or indirectly affected by the case. So each chapter takes us through a new woman or girl's story. And gradually, Phillips begins to kind of reveal the connections between the characters, the places, and of course, the themes of the story. And by the end, you realize that through these connections, she's introducing clues of sorts. I mean, it's hard to call them clues because this is not a traditional mystery, but you are getting um, hints about the fate of the girls. So for instance, this, the second chapter after the one in which we see the girls taken, um, we, we are introduced to Olya, who's a young teen and she lives in the main city of Petropavlovsk, which is down on the eastern, um, on the eastern coast of the peninsula and is the biggest city in, on the peninsula. Um, and we, Olya is, is a typical teen. She's on face, you know, she's on um, social media and she's, trying to look at what her best friend's doing and she finds out that her best friend is, is hanging out with these other people that she didn't expect. You know, it's a very typical teen story. But we start to see how those two girls' disappearance have affected everyone when later in the story, Olya's best friend's mother decides that Olya is not a good influence and she shouldn't be able to hang out with her daughter. And part of this is because Olya's mother leaves her alone in the same way that the missing girl's mother does. You know, there's, so you, you get these little, even though these people don't know each other, they don't know the girls, there are these connections and, um, and the effects of the story on the, the characters in the book. Um, so with every new chapter um, and every new character, Phillips is adding layers of descriptions of life on the peninsula. And the layers that she portrays have to do with class, um, there's things about generations, the Soviet generation versus the new Putin generation. Um, there are things to do with race and culture, the cultural differences, for instance, between the native people of the north of the peninsula who are traditional herding and fishing cu cultures um, and the Russians who the native people call the white people. Um, there's also the differences between the city, which is Petropavlovsk, Pavel, Plavba, say that six times. Petropavlovsk, which I mentioned is the biggest city, and then Esso, which is quite a small city up north, about eight hours north. Um, and, you know, some of the characters live there. So you get those contrasts. Um, and you also get the kind of like the beauty of a countryside in Kamchat can seem to be people who like to really hike and camp and fish and hunt. So there's, and, and this, I looked at some of the pictures on Google. I mean, the it's stunning scenery, really beautiful. Um, so, and then woven through all that are themes of loss and longing, which are very important in this book. Um, many of these women are wishing for a different life or trying to find themselves in amidst the kind of restrictions of their culture. Um, some of them lose or have lost people. 
and of course that theme is kind of set up by the mystery of the of the lost girls um, that kind of underpins the whole book um, and yes there is some res resolution to that story of the girls i won't say more than that i'll leave it up to you as to whether you think it's a satisfactory resolution or not um, and although you will care to know the ending this is a book that is really about the journey and the tapestry that phillips weaves um, in, it's a story that I found, like at the end, I wanted to go back to the beginning and read it through again so that I could see um, all of these different threads again and see how she weaves them together once you know the ending, how she's we woven them together and brought all these people and places and themes together to bring you to the, this, this, this final um, work of art, really. I thought it was really great. I uh, was totally pulled along by it, even though sometimes I worry a little bit about, you know, things that are linked short stories. I wonder if I'm going to be, you know, am I going to have to like get into it all over again every time I turn into a new chapter? I didn't, I didn't feel that so much with, I mean, a little bit, but then she grabs you. She does it so well. The characters are really, really well done. So I think highly recommend. A lot of the um, best of 19, best of 2000 oh, yeah. lists and, and deservedly so I thought, yeah. yeah the writing is the writing is really good um and, and I, I i think what you were saying about the um i mean i totally agree about the characters and the mystery and so forth but i i really was drawn into the location which oh yeah um all the stuff that she you know a culture i just felt like i knew nothing about was, nothing at all i mean it's I not one that you hear about to google earth to Mm -hmm. I did the same. <laughs> Where is this city and how does this all this stuff fit together? Yeah, I was like, how long would it take to get from from the city to Esso and you know, all that kind of stuff. It's it's pretty cool. And she she lived there for a while. So she does, you know, mm -hmm. I think she lived there for a year or two. Mm -hmm. So she has, I mean, and it's a big city, but it's still it's isolated. I mean, it's very isolated. It's the whole culture feels to me to be very isolated. And there's this whole thing of like, how, where have the girl, could the girls have gone if, because how do you even get off this peninsula? You know, you have to go so far north and then around to get to the mainland. Um, and the only other ways are off by ship and by air, air. And, you know, so there's that part of the, that's but isn't, part of the mystery. isn't it on the like other side of Siberia in Russia? Like, isn't it like if you were in like, Western Russia, right? If you were in like St. Petersburg and you right. were headed across Russia to go there, would you, you have to go? It's on the far, it is the far Eastern side of Russia. Yeah. Like through Siberia, which is yeah. already what we use as like the, the center of the earth. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, it's really close. It's actually quite close to Alaska. So in some ways it's, you know, you might, and I think the native cultures there are maybe no, I think that I uh, just to, I think that that's where Yul Brenner was from. He he was Russian. He he's uh, from that area. Really? Yeah. I didn't, okay, that's interesting. Cool. I I imagined it as being kind of not that I've been there, but I pictured it kind of like an equivalent to Anchorage, which is a big mm -hmm. city, but mm -hmm. like with a similar kind of um, native and non-native culture. And like this big modern city, but so isolated from everything else. Yeah. Um, and it almost seemed like the Russian equivalent of that. Yeah, definitely. It, there, there are, and and the scenery. I I feel like when you look at it, could be something maybe out of Alaska as well. Um, really gorgeous mountains and rivers and forests and um, maybe not quite as harsh or and big as Alaska in a way, but. Um, do you know how the author happened to be there? No, you know, I don't know why she was there. Sure. But it's such an odd place to end up. Yeah, in. but honestly, it made me want to go. I mean, yeah. I find it fascinating. I went one time on the Amazing Race. I remember that because ah. they actually took the Siberian Railroad like across. Right. For a while. It seems like it would be, I'm going to plug our summer reading bingo. It seems like it would be a really good choice for, yes, for the <laughs> if you've never been to Russia, which I never have. No. So. And even, yeah, even if you've been to Russia, Kamchatka, again, so removed, probably <laughs> you could count that. All right. So I think we're going to next move on to Bridget, right? Yes, Bridget. That's me. 
okay, so I'm I'm going to have a very different <laughs> timeline, story wise, <laughs> location, everything. <laughs> very different place. So I am going to talk about a a new book. It actually just came out like last week in July called The Care and Feeding of Waspish Widows. <laughs> I love it. Perhaps <laughs> you he is a very, very sexy cover, is a, uh, so it is a historical lesbian romance, which you, you might think, are there a lot of those? And I will answer, no, there are not. <laughs> <laughs> there are becoming more of them. Yeah. So this is by Olivia Waite, is the name of the author. And it's actually the second in a series that she's calling the Feminine Pursuits series. The first one is called The Ladies' Guide to Celestial Mechanics, which is about... I love her titles. Yeah, so they're, uh, they're sort of... So they each are focusing on also like a scientific aspect. In this one, Waspish Widows is beekeeping. And there's beekeeping. Oh, oh. It is a love story between a, uh, a female beekeeper who lives in sort of a small town outside of London and a recently widowed printer... Um, she owns a print shop in London, and they and they have a printing press in this town. And she ends up with some bees in her printing press. She gets directed to the the local beekeeper, uh-huh. and they start to be friends. <laughs> and eventually, a romance. It is a I will say it is a very very slow burn um, romance. <laughs> there is I would say a good three quarters of the book. They're just kind of like we're friends and we write letters. Not exactly. Are they steamy letters? At least they they are not at that point. So it is it is a very slow burn. Um, but it then it it gets sort of steamy at the end. But it it, it's just very well done. Um, it's it is romantic. I quite one of the things that's interesting about this is that both of these women are older. They're not. They're in their forties. They're not like so old, but they are not like usually heroines of these types of stories tend to be quite young women in historical mm-hmm. romances. So these are people who have, have lived entire lives, you know, have lived lives right. and are a little bit older experienced. Uh, it's, it does delve into the beekeeping. It also has a little bit of like revolutionary politics because it's set in the in 1820 and deals a little bit with um, the return, like when King George became was, went from the regency to becoming king mm-hmm. and he divorced he wanted to divorce his wife because she was unfaithful now he was very unfaithful to her so it was kind of a hypocritical but it, it it sort of became a a cause taken up by reformers that were like the king is corrupt and hit like we support the queen in like she he's trying to be nasty to her so it, it's it's complicated i don't know all the politics but they kind of go into it it's an interesting time of like some reform but not a ton uh and it's just it's just a very sweet romance i i think it's it's lovely uh so if you're in the mood for a romantic story not starring like young women this is a, this yeah. Nice well, and like you said, the historic, the historical. Yeah, and if you enjoy sort of yeah, a historical sure. moment, there's clearly a lot of research that she's put into it. I think one of the things that I would say is I think that um, there's sort of a little boomlet in LGBT um, historical romances right now being put out by mainstream author by mm-hmm. mainstream presses. Um, I would not say there's a ton of them, but there are, are more than there used to be. Another prominent author is Cat Sebastian, who who writes these same things, and uh, so it's it's kind of a period. If you are interested in historical romance and are interested in LGBT issues, there there's there's things out there that might not have existed before, yeah. and I do think they're reflective of romance authors attempting to be more inclusive of history as a whole. And so it's like it, it's being it's acknowledging that you know queer people have always existed but these books often also include characters of color and more and women who do things that are not just debutantes and are this book is actually has no one in the aristocracy who isn't a main character there's just like side characters which is very rare for historical romances kind of refreshing really yeah Yeah. it's 
very rare. And I heard an interview with Olivia Waite where she said that in her the third book in this, there are zero aristocrats at all. <laughs> <laughs> this one has some as supporting characters, but that in the third book, there's going to be none. <laughs> We can make that an appeal factor, zero of risk crap. Isn't no, there no. always a handsome lord who's, you know, there that's is the whole point, you know? Lord. Obviously there would be no handsome lord here because they are lesbians, yeah. but. <laughs> well, there could be, but he'd just be sort of peripheral. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lifts things. <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, I think that they're appealing and interesting characters, and the time is interesting, and it's like a light, fun read for the time. So if you're, if you want to end your summer on a on a on a cheery note, there's and a an older lesbian historical romance by um, Isabel Miller called Patience and Sarah, and that's got some of they're not aristocrats because they're in a brand new United States, and that's a very, very slow burn, very sweet. It's, it's really nice. What was yeah. that one again, Beth? It's called Patience and Sarah by... Uh, Patience and Sarah, okay. By Isabel Miller. Got it. Okay. All right. Beth, do you have something? Oh. Yeah. So going from lesbians to murder, straight murders. <laughs> we're too on. <laughs> We don't have to make the connections here. It's okay. <laughs> so my book is um, called The Holdout by Graham Moore. <clears throat> and he's written a couple of other books, a couple of other novels. Um, another one that was a mystery, which they were both historical, actually. They were both historical novels. Um, so this is his second one. And he's also a screenwriter. And he wrote the screenplay for The Imitation Game yeah. with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, where he plays Alan Turing. And he won the Academy for that. So nice. he's got, he's got uh, chops there. Uh, so this is a legal mystery. Um, and it has similarities to 12 Angry Men, the 1957 movie, where there's a jury and they have to come up with a unanimous verdict of guilty or not guilty about this young boy, white boy, uh, about whether he's committed murder or not. Um, so the in, after the initial vote, they all agree that he's guilty except one. And that 12th juror eventually convinces everyone to vote not guilty. Mm. So what Moore does is he takes that premise with a different trial and says, well, what happens 10 years later? So in, in this trial, it's a 25-year-old African-American man who's accused of murdering his white teenage student, girl. Not lesbian, right? Not gay. Um, and again, when they go into the, the, the when they're, they're all sequestered, and when they go in to vote, the first vote is 11 for guilty and one for not guilty. And Maya, our heroine, is the one that's saying not guilty. And eventually, she convinces everyone to vote not guilty. So then, 10 years later, they're all meeting again because one of the jurors says he has new information, new evidence. That juror is named Rick, and he was having an affair with our heroine at the time. So before, oh, and he, th the reason they're doing this is because they're going to do it on TV for a show called Murder Town. It's like a, real, a reality show. Exactly. And I was like, wait, isn't that real? And so I looked it up and no, there's, well, there is actually. There's Serial and there's S-Town, but there also is something called Murder Town from the UK, that's also a podcast. And then we have in the state something called Murder Town, a TV series. So I don't think this is any of them, but I just was like, oh my God, I kept on thinking of you, Bridget. <laughs> <laughs> you would love this one. <laughs> so before they can air the program and, and Rick can reveal what, what the new evidence he has is, guess what? He gets He's murdered. Yeah, of course he does. Of course. So then, and he's murdered in Maya's room. Oh. So she is, of course, the prime suspect. Got it. So how do 
how is she going to get out of this? Did the original man accused of the murder come back and murder Rick for some reason with this about this new evidence? Did one of the jurors, was he going to shed something, some information about one of these jurors? Did they kill him? Mm. Um, so she has to figure this out before she gets jailed. Um, the way the book progresses is it's kind of like yours in that it's, in Karen, in that it's the 12 jurors, mm -hmm. except that it goes from the present day of Maya and what she's dealing with and trying to solve the mystery to then interspersed is the story, the backstory of each of the other 11 jurors. Okay. Their flashbacks to when the trial was going on and it, it, so it builds the background of these characters mm -hmm. and it shows their flaws um, and all their secrets. Right. So right. with this technique, more builds, um, builds the tension into a really gripping mystery. Um, lots of twists and turns and a final huge reveal at the end. Um, so, but I do wanna say it is more than a mystery because Moore explores the intersections of race and class and the American justice system. Um, those are examined throughout the novel, particularly through the multifaceted levels of expectation, misunderstanding, and outright prejudice. Um, the notion that race is, has more to do with guilt or innocence than the evidence. Yeah, it's clearly shown through the varied perspective of the jurors. It's set in LA, um, but it doesn't, he doesn't really focus on the setting that much. Um, he's much more focused on the plot, the issues, the characters, the dialogue. I think that his work as a screenwriter really shows through in the dialogue. It's, it's really well done. It's very idiosyncratic to um, whichever character is speaking. Um, it pulls you in, I was pulled in, and I couldn't wait to figure out who done it. Um, so I, I really enjoyed it. I, I think it's, uh, it, was a good, it was a good read. Um, Sounds like it. Yeah, and I think if you do like it, then a similar book would be Body in Question by Jill Clement, which is also Juror's Two of them have an affair, and that has long-lasting repercussions, just like in this one. Um, and it's also a very intricately plotted thriller, mm -hmm. which this one is too. So that's Graham Moore's The Holdout. Great, thank you. Jeffrey. I'm up. Um, yes, I just finished um, the, the latest Martin Walker uh, mystery. He writes a series called um, Bruno, the Bruno Chief of Police series. Bruno is a um, sort of small town village uh, gendarme, essentially, but he's um, in a little village called saint -Denis. It's fictionalized, but um, if you've been to this part of France in the Perigord region, the Dordogne region of France, um, which is where the author actually spends most of his time now. He's a British author but he lives in this region now, which is actually true of a lot of Brits. It's a very popular um, retirement destination for um, Brits who, um, who go to France and buy vacation homes or retirement homes. So um, unlike the LA that, that Beth was talking about, the setting is really, really important in this series. Um, and every one of the books, I, I like them. This is the 14th in the series. It's called um, The Shooting at Chateau Rock. Um, I like them because the, you, you like going back to this village. There's a whole um, ensemble cast of, of different characters in the village um, and you get to know them gradually over time. Um, and so every, every new version in, uh, in the series is kind of like going back to a place where you know the people and you wanna see what, what's been sounds happening like, with them. Sounds like Penny. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I always mention about him is, um, and it's important at this time of year because Louise Penny is coming out with another one. I believe it's, is it the end of this month or yep. very, very soon? She's very, very soon. The next one. Put yours on hold. 
And if, if you're ever looking for a good read-alike for Louise Penny, I think uh, Martin Walker has some very similar appeals. Um, they're not identical, but um, the place is very important. He has, uh, there's a strong cast of characters that's built around a particular town, um, a small town, um, and a lot of what goes on um, is not just the mystery, but the personal lives um, and the development of the characters. But another thing I think that makes them very similar is that he, like Penny, um, his mysteries always have, um, they're not cozy by any means. It's, it's a nice, comfortable feeling of being in a, enjoying the culture of France and that sort of thing. But they're not, they're not dark exactly, but there's always some larger social issue that the mystery deals with that may have something to do with the French justice or criminal system, or it may have to do with immigrants, cultures clashing in, in small town France, or um, there's always things like that that make the mystery a little more topical mm -hmm. uh, in the world. Um, and I, I like that, that he does that very well the way that Penny does. Yeah. Um, unlike Penny, I think you could probably get away with reading the Walker mysteries not absolutely in order. Um, I think you'd enjoy them more if you do read them in order, but I don't think it's absolutely necessary because he does a very good job of going back and reminding you of, of who all these people are. But anyway, this, this particular one, um, the mystery is that um, there's the heirs of a local elderly sheep farmer, brother and sister, find out that they've been disinherited um, right before their father um, dies of a heart attack, seemingly of natural causes. There's no particular indication of foul play, but they find out that right before he died, um, he decided to um, change his will so that his estate went to pay for, to an insurance company that would supposedly pay for him to stay in this incredibly luxurious retirement home that just opened um, in, in the same general area, where because he did this, he would be able to stay there for the rest of his life living in luxury. And this was really not something that he would be expected to do. And the timing is all just very suspicious. So the mystery all um, revolves around trying to determine whether this was an accident, was there foul play, and it leads to um, an investigation that brings in some shady insurance companies and some shady lawyers. And then it turns out that some of them have connections to a Russian oligarch. And so there's all kinds there's of- There's the social issue. Yeah, there's the social issue. There's Russia again. There's, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, as Bruno, who is um, the, 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 local, um, the local chief of police becomes the, he is the detective. And as he's doing the investigating, um, who should turn up in the village but the daughter of the Russian oligarch, because she's part of this circle of friends um, that hang around um, a chateau that has been renovated and is owned by an aging rock star um, who is trying to bring back his career. And um, so that's kind of peripheral, but all these things end up coming together um, and the, the mystery, it's, it's a good, it's a solid mystery. Um, there's some really nice twists and turns. Many of his books are kind of similar in, in that respect, that there, there's always this really well-drawn mystery in all the characters in the town. And, um, and he mixes in a lot of culture and food too. Um, Bruno is not only a good cop, but he's um, a really good chef. And of course he is. Yeah. Uh, without yeah. actually putting recipes in the book, they, um, Martin Walker does a good job of kind of subtly introducing the way he, um, he enjoys living in the French countryside. So there's, um, if you like that kind of culture, there's a lot of discussion of wine and the prehistoric caves that are in that part of the country and truffles well, I think and farming and cheese and foie gras and all of that. So it's, he, he does, and of course he lives there, so he's really... Yeah. Done a good job of bringing all of that stuff together. In the in in terms of the food and the mystery, that's similar to Camilleri, the um, yes, actually, Andrew Camilleri he, he series is, is about um, Inspector Montalban. Yeah, in um, Montalbano. In so, Rome. Yeah, if you like those, um, Sicily. Those tend to be much shorter than than this, but there there is a very similar sensibility 
a lot of the same characters come up again. There's some humor, um, but the underlying mystery is actually quite serious. Um, and it's, they're, they're not dark, they tend not to be horribly violent, um, but there's lots of good twists and turns and, and the mix of the serious social issues and the sort of comfy small town mm -hmm. here, I think is, is a nice yeah. mix that he does well. And, and yes, definitely, if you like Penny, if you like Camilleri, I think they all do go together um, very well. So that's, um, this, again, this is the 14th in the series. It's called Shooting at Chateau Rock, and it just came out in May. Great. And speaking of other favorite mystery writers who are coming out with new ones, um, Tana French has one coming out in uh, early October. So definitely on the list for that one myself. Um, okay, um, so that's it for now, but I just wanted to say that um, we did have a couple of author talks this summer that we recorded and they are available on our YouTube channel. So if you're watching this on Facebook or anywhere, um, navigate on over to our, um, our YouTube channel and you'll be able to see um, one about one really locally related, right? About Richard by Richard Creevy. It was um, a book about Lucius Beebe and his trains, the his train photography. Um, beautiful, be beautiful pictures in that book, um, which we have copies of. And the other one was just recently we um, interviewed or qu questioned. I don't know. Had audience questions for um, David Wedge who was one of the co-authors of a book, the latest book about Whitey Balfour called Hunting Whitey. So that's a kind of another local interest story. Both of those are on our YouTube channel, um, along with all of our other recorded programming. So visit us there and we will see you back again here in a couple of weeks. Um, and until then, this has been BB Book Buzz. We'll see you next time. Bye. Okay.